college. Our next speaker of the day is Dr. Mahija Janathan. Dr. Mahija did her graduation in dentistry and post-graduation in old pathology and microbiology from Mahatma Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Dental Sciences. After completing her post-graduation in 2003, she joined the College of Dental Sciences Dawoodere and worked there for a short period of one year. She then joined Amrita School of Dentistry, Amrita Institute of Dental Sciences in 2004 and is currently a professor in the Department of Oral and Maxification Pathology in the same institute. A passionate teacher and an ardent pathologist, Man is actively involved in the academic and research activities of the department. She has guided many postgraduate and undergraduate research works and has to her credit more than 50 publications in peer-reviewed national and international journals and has also given around 50 presentations on both national and international platforms. Her field of interest is tumor immunology and Ma'am is presently pursuing her PhD on the topic immune suppression in the tumor microenvironment of oral town squamous cell carcinoma. She is an active member of Fire Society of Oral Maxillofacial Pathologists, the official association of oral and maxillofacial pathologists of Kerala, and is presently the Honorable Secretary of the association. I am truly delighted to invite you, ma'am, to enlighten us with your share of knowledge. Thank you. I would like to thank the organizers of this wonderful platform and the people who are going to be part of this group. So, diagnosis is an art which requires a very systematic approach. And a pathologist plays a very integral role and important role in the patient management by providing an accurate diagnosis, which forms the basis for evaluating treatment. So, one of the biggest responsibility of the pathologist is that he or she needs to give the right diagnosis and passive of differential diagnosis which is provided to them or care. And for that, sometimes, sometimes we look at the diagnosis of the passive. And this time, based on the microscopic analysis of small tissue, which we receive in the form of passive. We do not have access to the patient as a tissue, but we get this all over the tissue in the form of biopsy. And if the issue is that, as in this case, the service usually provides a representative bit from a small area of this tumor, and we can see that there are around five bits. Surgeons are usually not good centers. Surgeons are not usually good centers, they usually give us a physical bit. And it's based on the microscopic, it's based on the microscopic evidence or microscopic diagnosis from the institutional biopsy. The patient decide how to go about it. If uh, they decide to do an excision, again, after the excision, they send the excision of the specimen to us. And this is for the confirmation of the diagnosis and also we need our opinion on margins. Margins are very important for the uh, clinicians because it tells them whether the tumors are completely removed or they, whether they need to be exploded. We also receive excision biopsy like this. So the tissue is very small like this. The coalition is uh, excised as a part of the treatment and will be submitted to us as a whole. And the challenge is we need to give a diagnosis from a small Tissue in the form of incisional biopsy specimen, a four micro thin section from this small biopsy. We need to do the microscopic analysis and extrapolate the findings over a tumor which is quite large. So, if you look at this, if you see, take a small piece of tissue from here, it's very difficult to tell that it is tobacco under snow or what tobacco looks like. Right? So, classification of this particular features in that way that. Us. And questions of multiple sections, you will do them 
that have been in parasitic infection could be ozonating. What condition are the sites? And this histology was not matching with any of the uh, histology of any of the uh, parasites which we have learned. It's not there in the textbook. I've not learned it. So I am seeing the slide in the background. The search was on. I told you, my, in our memory, there are different folders and different lesions. I mean, it's all the different lesions. I'm trying try to match this picture with all possible lesions I've seen. Then suddenly, I remember a case, a slide, in fact. Actually, one of the examiners who I come has not a slide, and probably I would have seen only five minutes or so. So I see one more slide which I've seen, and I'm saying, is it a with that? So that is a case of hyaliasis. Okay. Then I went back and started reading literature on hyaliasis and their living. So after reading, I understood that what I was seeing, a floral design, an outer thick cuticle. See, on that, if you see here, there are some irregularities, like longitudinal ridges. There's a thick muzzle. There's a cavity in the center, and within the cavity, there's gastrointestinal fat tract and genital tubule containing stomatocyte. This is much I could make out after I went through the articles and uh, textbooks. And what I was looking at was a uh, adult male biophilialysis. This much information we could get on that section. So, myofidelia is actually subcutaneous filaria. So they all are familiar with Cucharidia, Vampire, or Pili, but there's a different sort of uh, filarial work which occurs in the subcutaneous tissue. So, now we need to find out the species. How do we find out the species? There are certain characteristics which lead you to the species, and finally, the species turned out to be myofidelia repress, which is uh, common in Asian population, but older lesions are very this is actually a zoonotic parasite. It is seen in dogs. We are seen in dogs, not in human beings. But sometimes this worm can enter our skin through the mosquito bite. And once it enters into our body, into our skin, it can go the microfilaria, it can go to an adult worm. But if they cannot reproduce, it stops it. And usually, all these are um, you know, our immune response will kill this work, but sometimes it can go to the parasites. And that's what has happened in this case. And this lesion was diagnosed as subcutaneous myopalyanosis, and the case was published in the Indian Journal of Medical Research. And a few years later, I saw a report in the Indian Express saying that hey, this was reported in And this is a young patient, young patient, 12 year old patient, and the patient was a chest. A similar region. In this case, they could catch up from the worm axis. What we saw was a, a tissue section. Here, you can see the worm. This is how the worm looks like. And if you can focus more on the surface, there are longitudinal ridges. And this is how the worm looks like in uh, a scan microscope. A scan microscope. So these are ridges. Probably, if you take a section from the cross section, you might be able to relate with the terminology which you are seeing. These are the longitudinal ridges which are seen. This is a muscular layer. This is a central cavity. We have two cavities within. This is the GIT and this is the genital tube. And basically, when I was preparing uh, this uh, place, I was seeing that one case was reported in one hand, in one hand, in the, uh, again a type with eyes. It's very common in eyes. Telecaviasis is yes, common in eyes. But oral cavity, we are going to see. Well, it's for you. Which cases uh, can you identify the or can you do the diagnosis based on the clinical manifestation? In your life conditions, very similar to pathoma uh, which we have seen, but you can see that these fingers are a bit pointed. It's a common word, which is otherwise known as the recovery gaps. So I would like to compare it with low poly, not with poly now, because it's more pointed, and look at the similarity in the sections. So now coming to the third case, a uh, very interesting case. It's actually the species in front of us, species in front of us, and we call this one, for second opinion. This was a three-year-old female patient uh, with a specific condition involving the angular. You can see that it's a 
destroyed almost uh, the entire ramas and it's actually extremely deep in front of Mariposa. And when I saw the signs, it was looking like a cystic lesion. Cystic lesion because I could make out a thing, this is epithelial lining and this is the connective. But then, this was not treating me to any of the cysts which I have learned. Because uh, I just showed that this part of the because here you can see that there's four polymer cells because of polarity that shows that the one of the cells that is very particular. Again, the epithelial was undergoing. Now, he came with his x-ray. This is how it looked like. You can see a 
well defined values and vision over here. And it was uh, causing cooperation of the both buccal and dual cortical plate. This was on this diagnosis. And uh, with the x ray, the diagnosis could be chronic osteomyelitis, which is associated with recurrent odontogenic cancer. And there was nothing left over there. So surgeons didn't have much option. They have to take off the cortical And the specimen was submitted to us for microscopic analysis. And uh, when we took the mandibular lesion, do you remember that two lesions on the uh, cheek and one on the mandible? So this is on the mandibular lesion. So hopefully in some areas, of course, it resembles odontogenic keratosis. You could see uh, the uh, cystic lumen, epithelial lining, and connective tissue capsule. It was keratinized, and there was something called dotosis, something looking like dotosis. Just a comparison with the odontogenic keratosis. Yes, it was recently. Autologic keratosis, but then most of the areas were different, very much different. We could see the anthophytic proliferation of epithelium into the stoma, and uh, the, so it was peculiar architecture. And epithelium was burrowing into the stoma, and we were able to see something called rhabic burrow, onion-like formation of the keratin bursts. the keratin bursts. This is very peculiar. And again, the problem was this was only mandibular area. But then, when we saw the cheek, the cheek also showed a very similar picture. If it was okay, see, the lesion has to restrict within the bone. But now the cheek area also was showing a very similar picture, telling that these two are actually extension. Extension of the same lesion and extension is not possible with autologic keratosis. Now the confusion was, is it oral squamous cell carcinoma? Carcinoma can infiltrate and go into the adjacent areas, can destroy the adjacent areas. But uh, we were actually in uh, total confusion. Uh, we were not able to settle down with uh, either OKC or with Swamisal carcinoma. Because Swamisal carcinoma, carcinoma, because uh, we were not able to see anything like dysplasia or uh, malignant epithelial cell as such. All epithelial islands appear to be very differentiated and uh, normal looking islands. Then we decided to do endoscopy as class. We saw it for us when we are in rows with uh, actually normal HD screening. So again, we did cytokeratin 19. All of you will be familiar with this uh, marker now. This is an autologic marker. We wanted to rule out autologic keratosis, and this was negative, saying that it is not OKC, it's not autologic epithelium. Then we also use another marker, PCNA, a proliferating marker, which we tell you that the issue is benign or malignant. Uh, it was uh, the uh, activity was very less. It was not as high as uh, how you see in oral squamous cell carcinoma. Finally, we settled down with a new diagnosis, carcinoma clinicator, which is a low grade variant of squamous cell carcinoma, which shows a typical burrowing pattern and the onion peel onion appearance. So again, this case was published in the uh, Journal of Phenomenology. So carcinoma clinicator is a okay aggressive lesion. It's a great variant of squamous cell carcinoma. No, histi no histological features of malignancy. You can always uh, get misleaded. So it starts as a small lesion like this. It's like a white area in Kubrickia. And this can cannot metastasize like the squamous cell carcinoma where it can spread to lymph nodes. But it can cause total havoc in the area where it is involved in. It can cause total destruction over there. And when it occurs in the alveolar mucosa, it can destroy the underlying bone, and sometimes it can mimic autologic keratosis. So now, putting together all these cases, each uh, case which I see is a learning experience for me. It's like uh, it's more than a dozen, it's a textbook, in fact. And each case I've seen have taught me something or the other. So now let's see what these cases are taught me. So first case, if you go back, it's peripheral ablogastoma. I will not consider peripheral ablogastoma clinically because uh, it is a rare lesion. Usually go for common, more common lesion. So what I learned is rarity is not a reason for exclusion. And the second case, oral diagnosis, because I was not aware of such an anxiety only. And it occurs in the rest of the body, but I was not uh, aware of an oral lesion so far. So it's like, even if I'm an oral pathologist, I cannot restrict myself to oral pathology alone. Any 
which is occurring in any part of our body can open the whole cavity. So there is no limit have to broaden my horizon. And the third condition taught me that importance of competition. So at least which you are seeing, might be a new condition. Maybe she was just not, she not distract anywhere else. So that was a lesson for me. And the whole case taught me that I should be cautious about the septic mimics. But we might go around sometimes, and the treatment also maybe. So we won't be going to go the patient if we make an act. So we can't afford to make an act in this diagnosis. So with that, let me conclude by saying that known is a drop and unknown an ocean, but always do remember that any drop makes an ocean. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, ma'am. That was truly an eye opener, especially your lessons learned. I hope we all have learned our lessons through ma'am. Now, I would like to request our chairpersons to share their concluding remarks. Seeing the unseen. Thank you, Dr. Mahija, for uh, such an enlightening talk on uh, this clinico-pathological correlation of uh, some very rare conditions of the oral cancer. I think uh, we all learned a lot from this presentation. And uh, I just wanted to ask you regarding that uh, peripheral amyloblastoma which you showed. Yes. And what are the periodontal findings uh, you had? Uh, uh, because uh, it was, it, it looks like a aggressive uh, periodontitis, like a localized uh, lesion, like here. Yeah. It, it, it can't be the situation of periodontitis. So pretty that I'm done from it because I, I know it was uh, during my initial stages and I can remember exactly like how the condition was. So pretty that I'm done mobility in the tooth. And what mobility was not was because of periodontitis, it was caused because of the bone loss, because of the pressure effect on the tube. So what was the reason uh, uh, it had any external uh, swelling? Yes, yes, yes. 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 So we don't bother much about it. So when we did the excision, we may think it's a papilloma, but we're about to be peripheral So we should be discussed. And uh, the treatment was restricted to only local excision? No, no. So initially we thought it's papilloma and it was excised. Later on, when we saw the lesion, the margins were not. I was talking about the margins. We, uh, pathologists, we see the margins also. We, uh, uh, we do not understand also the diagnosis alone. So when we saw the margins, margins were not free. So that uh, information was conveyed to the researcher and uh, they did a uh, restriction of that entire segment. And that was removed. And that was removed and the margins were free. Till the margins were free. Uh, I think I was repeated twice. Uh, I also would like to add that uh, Dr. Bindraj and Mahija Mahija is a very good vegetable garden and uh, <laughs> just make my best <laughs> use <laughs> of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sirs. I now request the chairpersons to kindly present a token of appreciation to our speaker. Ma'am, kindly please be on stage. Thank you.
Without further delay, let's begin the next of our session. I would like to invite Dr. Anila S., Professor and Head, Department of Paleontology, St. Gregorius Dental College, and Dr. Nirpama Sri.